Well, good Saturday morning, everybody. Welcome back. Welcome back. Welcome back. I'm sports mental health empowerment coach and couple marriage and family therapist, Dr. Lauren Pitts. Y'all know who that guy is. My own personal Mr. Clean. (laughs) (laughs) Rub the head, rub the head, rub the head. And this is House Talk pregame, y'all. Welcome back. Welcome back. Indeed, indeed. I would, I'm not alone this morning, uh, Dr. Piss. I got I got a couple other gentlemen with me that you know are part of the Mr. Clean Club. So you know I, I, I feel <laughs> I feel in good company this morning. So you yes. know I'm feeling real good. You know we got a special special guest with us today. I'm super excited. I had to go break out the VSU football polo, Coach. I ain't put this on in a while, man. So you know <laughs> I'm excited. We got Dr. Henry Frazier the third, the brand new Virginia State University head football coach. Welcome, welcome, welcome this morning. How are you, sir? I'm doing well. Thanks for having me. No problem, no problem. We're going to get to Coach real, real soon because we have a very, very, very special topic as we close out season two of House Talk Pre-Game. This is the show 45, y'all. Can y'all believe that? 45 shows this season. It feels like it. I feel like, it I, it feel, I feel like Jimmy Butler did in the finals back in 2020. When he was hunched over in game six, like he done gave it all. Like, that's how I feel today. But you know what, coach, what they always say, last set, best set, Mm -hmm. you know, we're going to make it do what it do. So our topic today is lodging and discontent, the discomfort of your comfort zone, a feeling of uh, communities at the core sports where fans turn, turn where times are tough. Most athletes' personal stories include an awakening where an athlete realizes a love for sport and resolve to excel in that sport. Their zeal drives them to train and practice long hours each day. They forsake everything else for the cause. Have you ever wondered what motivates such dedication? Is it launching, discontent, or a little bit of both? So we're going to be talking about, you know, what's a what's a athlete's why? What do they really do? You know, mm-hmm. we always talk about, you know, most athletes have a story. They come from, you know, a certain situation and things like that. But that's not every athlete's story. Every athlete has a unique individual story of their own to get to the point where they're at. So we're going to be talking about some of those things and also the value of being uncomfortable sometimes, getting out of your comfort zone and how sometimes being in your comfort zone can be uncomfortable as well. So we're going to be talking about all those things with Coach Henry Frazier today, as well as we also have Ted Wright with us as well in the audience. So we got a great conversation lined up for you all today, as well as, as you all know, the last 24 hours in the country, um, has not been a, a good 24 hours at all. Um, you know, and, and Dr. Piss is gonna to touch on that in a few minutes um, as we talk about, you know, Roe v. Wade and the overturn of that by the US Supreme Court yesterday. Um, so we're gonna get into that in a few seconds now. So, all right, let's get ready y'all. So Dr. Piss, go ahead and hit us with your mental health tip of the week. So I'm gonna, t- so, oh wait, I'm gonna I'm put a heat advisory out. <laughs> Here's the heat advisory because this is one of those topics I kid you not, I immediately, I was in session, but I keep the news on in my office and I almost fell out my chair and the, the blood must have left my body because my client said, Dr. Pitts, what's wrong? Are you okay? And I said, oh my goodness, the Supreme Court just overturned Roe v. Wade. And it was one of my international clients and they were just like, oh my gosh, you know, people, everybody looks to us, right? As a, as a world power, we sort of in many ways sent the, we're the template for, for how things should be done. So it's, it's folks are not just having a, a number of emotional reactions here in the US, but it's having a global impact. But before I get into that, um, I said that I was going to keep in the forefront of your mind the importance of being aware that suicide is a leading cause of death in the United States and a major public health concern. When a person dies by suicide, the effects are felt by family, friends, and communities. Um, you, you have to pay attention. You have to pay attention to what's going on. And oh, by the way, in, in light of the things that are transpiring in the country right now, it's reasonable for, for those of us that are mental health practitioners to fully expect that this decision is going to impact mental health for a variety of reasons. And we have to be very much aware of that. Um, so if you or someone you know is in crisis, you can dial 911 if you're in an immediate emergency, or you can call the National Suicide Prevention Lifeline at 1-800-273-TALK. That's 1-800-273-8255, 24 hours a day, seven days a week, or you can use the Lifeline chat at suicidepreventionlifeline.com. 
www.lifeline.org and the lifeline is free confidential and available to everyone so Roe v wade you know i i felt like i was back in 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 u.s history class in in high school and i i found myself wondering what um my uncle tony who taught u.s history at the high school that i attended i found myself wondering what his thought would be as a man of the cloth um, he you know this is someone who taught u.s history for years and years and years and years and years was the head of the, the, the history department at our high school um, but he was also an ordained minister he was when he passed he was funeralized as a bishop he you know would have been promoted to bishop had he not passed and and i can't help but to wonder um, what his position on this was be, you know, uh, said oftentimes raised in a Christian home in the whole nine yards and you have these arguments, but I, I, I want to touch on a few things here and, I'm, and I promise I'm going to tie it to the mental health tip. So I wanted to acknowledge first, I'm going to give you a, just a quick U.S. history lesson in that we have three documents um, here in the U.S. that are referred to as our charters of freedom. And they are the Declaration of Independence, the Constitution, and the Bill of Rights. The Declaration of Independence expresses the ideals on which the United States was founded and the reasons for separation from Great Britain. The Constitution defines the framework of the federal government of the United States. The Bill of Rights is the first 10 amendments to the Constitution, and it defines citizens and states' rights in relation to the government. Now, as I was thinking about all of this, and, and I was, you know, a lot of the arguments, or in fact, I would suffice it to say that most of the arguments um, around <clears throat> a women's right, a woman's right to have an abortion or not, is is a lot of spiritual context, right? And um, pro life or, or pro choice, and I. I I get really frustrated. I, I will put a disclaimer out there. I didn't forewarn anybody that loves and cares about me that I was about to do this. So let me just go ahead and, and put this out here. Um, you, you've heard me often say, I don't tell you what I heard, I'll tell you what I know. As someone who has had an abortion and understands that um, first and foremost, that um, there were a variety of reasons why that decision was made. Um, I was carrying twins at the time, but yet again, I was a very, very high risk pregnancy. Um, I ended up miscarrying one of my twins. I still had a fetus in utero. Um, and after having an in-depth discussion with my parents and with my grandparents and with my partner at the time and with my partner's mother, the unanimous decision was made, you know, even though, again, I was reared in a Christian home. So I'm telling you now, I'm fully expecting to get phone calls and text messages because there's the people that I just mentioned are the only ones that know this, but I'm, I'm putting it out there because you, you know I'm transparent. Um, but the unanimous decision among those that were an integral part of my life at that time that I felt had say in that decision, um, we decided that it was the best choice at the time, but it was my choice. Um, in, in total transparency, again, at almost 55 years of age, I'm no longer ashamed to acknowledge that back then I was extremely, extremely promiscuous. I was broken and I operated from a wounded place every minute of every day of my life. And I didn't know who I was pregnant by. That was part of the problem, but it was my choice. Uh, the decision was made and the child was growing in my body, not in my partner's body, not in my mother's body, not in my father's body, not in my baby boy's body, not in anybody else's body. The child was growing in my body. So it was my choice. Um, as I reflect upon the conversations that I had with three of my cousins that, you know, they're my ride or dies. And they said, whatever you decide, because it's your choice that we will stick by you and we will love you unconditionally and we will support you in whatever you decide because it's your body and it's 
your choice. And as they rode to Cherry Hill, New Jersey with me and took me to the abortion clinic and fought the picket lines and people trying to physically assault me and physically restrain me from going in to have an abortion that was my choice. They stood by me and they endured that humiliation and that fear and that trauma that went with my choice. As I sat in the waiting room awaiting to have a procedure that was my choice. And the nurse talked to me and the doctor talked to me and I went through the procedure and I lie on the table and can feel the life of my child being sucked out of my body. It was still my choice. And as I got up and I went through the healing process and they said that it would take me about three to four days before I would be back up on my feet. And because I have other health issues, which is why I was a high risk pregnancy in the first place. And it took me almost a month to recover, but it was still my choice. And I had haunted womb syndrome for a good three, almost four years, but it was my choice because I still felt like I had a child kicking in my womb. And then several years later, when I decided that, you know what, maybe I would want to have some children. And, and oh, by the way, because I was reared in a Christian home and I didn't believe that God would love me anymore because I made my choice to have an abortion and, and felt unloved and undesirable and unwanted and, and like I was being damned to hell because of my choice. I had my tubes tied. That was my choice. And then fast forward several years later when I decided that I wanted to try to have more children and went to the doctors to have the blood work done and what have you and found out that I had sustained injury from having the abortion that was my choice because there were lacerations inside of my body from the violent procedure that occurred, but it was my choice. So then I had to undergo another surgery to repair the damage that was done from the abortion that was my choice. And I did that. And I was able to have children, though I never had any more children because deciding not to have any more children after all was my choice. And I, I went on and I thought about the traumatic experience and, and how many years I carried that guilt and that shame and that embarrassment and that humiliation and how I didn't believe that I was worthy of having any more children because I had done this God awful thing because it was my choice. And then as I began to grow and heal and mature spiritually, and I got in right relationship with God for myself, because that too was my choice, that I received the love of my Savior, Jesus Christ. And he said, daughter, I forgive you. And I received his forgiveness because it was my choice. And I no longer allowed people to condemn me because the Bible that I read says, now for there is now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus because behold, you're a new creature in Christ. And that was also my choice. Many would argue that as born again believers, you're either pro-life or pro-choice. I'm not gonna have that to be. What I will say is this, as it relates to life versus choice, I find it very interesting that in this United States of America, these founding documents seem to be documents that people pick and choose which ones they want to honor. This country was founded on God but yet we remove God from our schools. That sounds like a contradiction to me, but that was their choice. We live in a country that is, is banking on or, or using the constitution in relationship to the 10 commandments to support the overturning of Roe v. Wade because thou shall not commit murder. But we live in a country where the death penalty is still, because you know, death doesn't mean murder, right? Is kill. Last time I checked. I'm just saying. Alabama, Arizona, Arkansas, Florida, Georgia, Idaho, Indiana, Kansas, Kentucky, Louisiana, Mississippi, Missouri, Montana, Nebraska, Nevada. North Carolina, Ohio, Oklahoma, South Carolina, South Dakota, Tennessee, Texas, Utah, 
Wyoming still allow execution today. Now, now let Dr. Pitts pull the map out and do a comparative analysis for just a moment, if I may, on what that looks like as it relates to Roe v. Wade. Because see, what a lot of people don't realize is, is that the federal government's decision is impacted the state laws that affect abortion rights without Roe v. Wade. So for example, you have, there's states that abortion is banned by trigger laws. That's Idaho, Wyoming, Utah, South Dakota, North Dakota, Missouri, Oklahoma, Arkansas, Louisiana, Mississippi, Tennessee, Kentucky, and oh, but we, we can't forget Texas, the state that has over 6,000 gun retailers, but that's their choice. We, 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 we're not going to ban the death penalty because that's not murder. That's not murder. But having an abortion is murder. So their choice has removed our choice. But, you know, we're not going to talk about that because, you know, we these legislators, it's, it's, it's all good. What, what about, what about, let's, let's see, let's look at the Ten Commandments. Let's see. Um, thou shall not commit adultery. Huh. Seems like there's, there's a contradiction there. I, I, I don't know. But um, I know back in the day, there were laws in the Constitution that talked about adultery. And it seems like a lot of the adultery that's being committed in this country is being committed by who? Oh, politicians. Who knowed? Politicians committing adultery? But, but should we should we enact a law? Should we, should we overturn laws and, and put that back on the books? Should we honor them? Because, oh, by the way, it's never been taken off the books. If you take a deep look, it's still there. But, but we don't want to enact that, right? We, it's okay to break that law. It's okay. We, we, you know, because we, we get to pick and choose. Because it's their choice which laws we're going to honor and which laws we're going to dishonor. What about, what about husbands and wives? You can, you know, rape only has a statute of limitations of five years in this country and it's a crime, but you can go free because, you know, it, it's not rape when it's your wife because the Bible says that the wife's body is not her own. But oh no, oh wait, wait, wait. I read 1 Corinthians 7 down further and it says, that the husband shall fulfill his marital duty to his wife and likewise the wife to her husband and his body's not his own either. Oh my gosh. So I can castrate you if 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 you rape your wife, if if you cheat, I there's legal action that can be taken against you. Uh, I don't think so. Why are there so many contradictions? in this country, why can't we as women exercise? And, and if you want to make it a spiritual issue, last time I read, and I, you know, I read by word, last time I read, salvation is an individual experience. It's individual. You can't pick whether or not I go to heaven or hell or not if you even believe in a heaven or hell. So hypothetically, if I have an abortion and God doesn't forgive me and I go to hell for that, isn't that my choice? You tell me that it's my choice if I murder. You tell me that it's my choice if I steal. You tell me that it's my choice if I commit adultery. You tell me that it's my choice whether I vote or not. I mean, so basically it seems to me like I can only have the choices that the predominantly male governing body in this country says that I can have. So to me, that seems like a violation of my constitutional rights because the constitution talks about justice and equality for all. So how is it just, how is it equal if men and 
a couple of women, but she was outnumbered, get to tell me what I can or cannot do with my body. You don't have no heaven or hell to put me in or any other woman on this planet. So how do you get to tell me that I'm going to hell when you don't know my whole story? The damage that this decision is doing to the well-being of men and women is going to be catastrophic because there are so many situations and circumstances that far surpass the decision. There's so many contributing factors that an entire governing body in essence just told me that my whole story doesn't matter. You just silenced me, dismissed me, oppressed me, and suppressed me because you have a gavel. I read something that was profound. It says, if it was about babies, we'd have excellent and free universal maternal care. You wouldn't be charged a cent to give birth, no matter how complicated your delivery was. If it was about babies, we'd have months and months of parental leave for everyone. If it was about babies, we'd have free lactation consultants, free diapers, free formula. If it was about babies, we'd have free and excellent childcare from newborns on. If it was about babies, we'd have universal preschool and pre-K and guaranteed after school placements. What's next? My husband can rape me because I'm his wife and me saying no doesn't matter anymore. What's next? Slavery. We've already turned back the hands of time 50 years. Why don't we just go ahead and turn it back 150? Matter of fact, why don't we just release the 60% of people of color in our jails and prisons and put all of us and all of our inventions and everything that we brought to this country by the blood, sweat, and tears of our hands. Why don't you just put us all on boats and send us back to Africa? Oh, but that means that the entire nation would crumble because this nation was built on the back of our ancestors. But we won't have that discussion. We won't have the discussion about putting God back in schools. We won't have the discussion about the death penalty. We won't have any discussions about gun laws. It's okay to go into a school and murder children but you can't have a, an abortion when people don't know your whole story. This is going to add gasoline to an already raging mental health fire. And Ronnie, I hope your agency is ready because our work just quadrupled. And oh, by the way, since we just turned back the hands of time, the butcher shops are about to make a killing figuratively and literally. That's all I have. Like I said before the uh, show started, and and I'll say it again. Um, you know, thank you for sharing that, Doctor Pitts. Um, you know, I can't even fathom. You know how you feel as a woman, how women feel. Um, so, like I said before the show, I'm gonna sit this one out because obviously, at this point, enough men have given their opinion on women's bodies and how they should treat their bodies and things like that. So. I refuse to offer any opinion about what a woman should do with their body or anything like that. 
you know, just in my personal life, you know, watching my wife, you know, when she was pregnant last year and also, you know, the challenges we went through before she was pregnant. I, mm -mm. Yeah, I, that's not my place. It should never be a man's place to tell a woman what they should do with their bodies. I could only fathom if it was halfway the other way around, you know? So this is, it's unfortunate. And, and I will say this, you know, as much as, you know, we can, you know, cause an uproar and things like that, I think this solidifies what I've said on this show before, you know, at the federal level, you know, they do what's in the best interest of them. But these things are the result of a trickle down effect of not, take, not taking enough emphasis at the local levels, our local governments, because this is where this starts at. I always tell people, you might not be able to make a change federally, but locally, you can see the change and be the change you want to see in your area and start to fight for rights in your area. And hopefully as a collective, this can you know spread throughout. But it takes us as individuals holding our, our local officials accountable, actually being involved in the process of making sure that everybody is represented equally. And when we don't have that, we see things like this. We see people will do what's always in the best interest of their interest groups, not in the interest of the collective. So that's all I have to say about this. Dr. Pierce, thank you for sharing those words. Um, I, I'm praying for all women out there, you know, all of them, you know, because we have no business telling women what they should do with their bodies and how they should how they should move with their bodies. So, you know, I'm really disappointed, you know, in the country and, and the men of this country. You know, I, I just think that we don't do enough to protect our queens. We don't do enough to protect, you know, the women who who birthed us into this world, who carry us for for 10 months, who have to endure those physical, mental, emotional changes, who their spirits intertwine with our spirits as babies. You know, I, I don't think we do enough to protect that and, and, and cherish that in our women sometimes. So, you know, if, if you have a woman in your life, mother, grandmother, aunt, niece, sister, wife, girlfriend, whatever, hug them today. Let them know that you're there for them, that you support them no matter what, because we ask that as men. We ask our women to support us in any endeavor we go through, no matter if it's personal, professional, whatever the case may be. We ask them to support us without a shadow of a doubt. So as men today, we need to do that for our women. We need to let them know that we support you emotionally, physically, spiritually, all that without a shadow of a doubt, because they need that from us. It shouldn't, it should just be given. It shouldn't be an expectation. It should just be given. So if you have a woman in your life today, give her a hug and let her know that you support her. All right, Ronnie. Let's share all right. With you. Yeah. So <clears throat> As we said, we have a very, 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 very special guest today. I'm super excited because, hey, Coach, I'm going to let you know right now. I do have a semester of eligibility left, <laughs> I believe. I, I believe I have a semester left, all right? I just I think I have a semester. I, I hope I didn't use it all up in grad school. But, <laughs> you know, we, I'm going to have to check. I'm going to have to check with the, uh, the athletic department, see what's going on with that. But like I said, you all, we have Dr. Henry Frazier III here. He is the brand new head football coach at Virginia State University. Welcome again, Coach. How are you today? I'm, I'm doing well. I mean, I'm doing well. It was a heavy stop. It was a heavy stop, yeah. Dr. Pitts. I thought though your words were eloquent. They were, they were right on point. Being the father of, of four girls and um, two big sisters and, and, and my mommy being my best friend in the world, you know, it's, you know, I always go back to the origin. I would say, why was it implemented in the first place mm -hmm. in, in 73? So yeah. why, why, why did they implement this in the first place with Roe, Roe v. Wade? And then if you go back to that, then you figure out, so why are you taking it away now? Mm -hmm. So I think those are the fundamental questions that has to be answered you know, as a country. Yeah. Because what has changed what has changed in almost what 49 years that that you want to take this law off the books now? I mean, we can speculate all day. We can go back to the previous president. We can do a whole lot of speculation of why, but the gun laws remain the same. And so it's, it's an awakening for everyone. And this is not even a race issue. You know, most of the time, the things we deal with in this country, you know, they want to say black and white. This one right here is not. 
But in my 50 plus years on this earth, I've come to see or believe that there's layers to things. And this is probably just the beginning. Oh, yeah. yeah. And I think as a country, black, white, straight, gay, you know, whatever you whatever is going on that may be different than someone next to you, I think is a part of, of, of a unified front needs to begin. Yeah. You know, because it's it's something more coming, you know. And that's just been my experience. So I, I appreciate you know being on. I know you know, I wanted to talk a little ball and things like that, but you know, when when, when times happen in the country like yesterday, you, you can't ignore it. You can't that's ignore right. it. And you know, football, the book, things just seem not that important when something like that occurs and that, that needs to be talked about. Yeah. Definitely. I'm a ball coach. Oh, yeah. I, I, I'm excited for, to be at Virginia State. And I, I'm looking forward to, to building a, a, a program that everyone will be proud of, a program where young men won't go from boys to men. And I like to have my hand on that and, 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 and making them productive citizens, you know, proud alumni and, 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 and good fathers and, 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 and uncles and sons and husbands. And that's been what I've always been about in 30 plus years of, as a ball coach. Definitely. And, and coach, speaking of that, I, I want to kind of brag on you a little bit because I had a chance to, you know, read over your bio and everything. And, and coach, I will say, like, you are the embodiment of what we consider a scholar athlete who has transitioned beautifully into the adult world and just become not only a, a great football coach, but a great scholar and a great man. You know, so for, I'm gonna read. I'm gonna read a little bit of your highlights in your bio because I mean, coach, if there's one word, if reading your bio, if there's one word I could describe, it was transformational. Like everywhere wow. you go, you were transformational. And so for those who don't know Dr. Henry Fraser, you know, born and raised D.C., attended Fairmont Fairmont Heights High School in Capitol Heights, Maryland, was a four was a uh, four letter athlete in high school in football, basketball, and golf. Coach, I know you went on to play college football at Bowie State. <laughs> But what was your favorite? Was football your favorite sport, or did yeah, you have it was a always favorite? football? And it was always football. And everything else was just to pass the time. Um, <laughs> my basketball coach was actually the offensive line coach, so he made me play basketball. Oh wow! Coach okay. Payton was the football was the golf coach, the head football coach, so he made me play golf. And then uh, Coach Martin was the baseball coach. He was my my chemistry teacher, and. <laughs> I was able to only play like two years after I got out of chemistry in 10th grade. I ain't played no more because I wasn't out to see Coach Martin. <laughs> he not the boss of you. No, nah, no. Nah, I was like, after the chemistry, because I, I, you know, I wasn't taking out all the rest of that stuff. After chemistry, I was like, I had enough. But so you know, I, coaches, I've always gravitated towards my coaches. Ever since mm -hmm. my dad died last day of school in second grade. Oh, wow. And, and I was the youngest in the household. And and I had my mom and my two big sisters. And so I gravitated to my coaches. Yeah. You know, they were like father figures, role models, and they did a great job, in my opinion, in terms of, of and I've always stayed close to them. So when they was, would ask me to do something or tell me to do something, I would always do it. I was always one of those players that listened to the coach, you know, and I'm so glad I was blessed to have really good men that <laughs> cared about my development, not just me shooting baskets or making plays or throwing the ball. They cared about what type of man I was going to become. And that's the type of coach that I am because that's what I got. That's the coaching that I got. You know, anyone that ever played for me, <clears> tell you, <throat> they always joke me. All my assistant coaches be like, oh, man, he don't coach. He don't, he don't call no plays. He don't do nothing because I focus off the field. I figure if I could eliminate all the distractions by, by Friday, Saturday night, whether it's high school, college ball, you're going to give me everything you got. Mm. So, but I will hire really good coaches for the X's and O's and things like that. But they, I do know a little bit of football, but, <laughs> but, I, but my focus is always to hire really good coaches. Don't micromanage them, let them do their thing. And I focus off the field, make sure that these young men uh, are where they're supposed to be from an emotional standpoint, from a spiritual standpoint and uh, the physical, the mental they can they can handle that with the coaches and, and, and workouts and study halls and the 
tutors and all those things. But that emotional piece is where I flourish as a coach. That can give away all my secrets, though. Oh, man, that's dope. And, and I mean, you know, like, it, it, I, I think that's, I think we've seen in the last five years that has become the shift and, and, and <clears throat> finally a focus for, you know, not only our student athletes, but for our coaches as well. You know, and I, and I always say, you know, I, I understand, you know, as, as a you know collegiate coach or whether it's high school coach, whatever the case may be, you know, at the end of the day, you have a job to do. And that's to coach and lead young men and stuff like that. Even at the collegiate level and professional level, even higher than that is you got to put food on your own table. Yeah. And so, you know, I always say, you know, I could always understand where a coach has to draw that line between professional and personal. And, you know, to your point, you know, I, I was fortunate enough to have, you know, coaches who, you know, definitely took in consideration our emotional part and, and definitely understood how to coach not only a team, but also each individual player on that team, because that's important. And we always hear, you know, you can't coach players the same way. You just can't have an iron fist with an entire team when, you know, maybe your star player, maybe your key players, they don't take that type of approach. They don't take that type of talking or communication. So you have to really be in tune with your players and be able to read a room and understand like, Things change on a day-to-day -day basis, so that's, that's really special that you that you've acknowledged that as a coach. And just to you know finish reading through your bio real quick, you know as as much success as you've had a coach, you were also very successful as a player in your own right. You know being a quarterback at Bowie State, going 18-3 and one as a starter, and also winning a, a CIAA <laughs> championship. You know, and then also after that, moving on into you know where you are vice principal at Central High School and implementing this program fall or football and life league you know, a program that was designed to uplift young people through applying life and athletic skills in order to excel on and off the field of play. And then, you know, moving on a little bit, you know, your time at Prairie View a and talk about that a little yeah. bit, because, you know, when I was reading it and it said that, you know, they had lost 80 straight games, you know, I, there's a high school in Richmond, I want to say it was, um, I want to say it was Thomas Jefferson, and they had a streak like that. I don't think it was 80, but it was at least about, I think, 50, 60 plus games. Wow. And, you know, I remember when I was in high school, when that streak had started, you know, you just be like, you know what it's like to go to practice. And, you know, when you you have a good week of practice, you're like, OK, I think we got a good chance to win. You also know what it's like when you have practice and things just don't go right. You're like, yeah, I don't know, but I don't know about this week. <laughs> but I can only imagine week in and week out, especially at the collegiate level, week in and week out, knowing like, yeah, bro, I don't know. Like, I, we, we might score. We might get a first down, you know, like, so talk about that. You know, I always, I, the way I could describe you as being transformational. So talk about that process of leading those young men at Prairie View A&M and really turning around that program in the time you were there. Yeah, that that's special. That was a special time. Um, I wasn't a part of the 80 game losing streak. <laughs> I got there about three or four years after they snapped it. And I think they may have won like one game during that year, those three years after they snapped them one or two games after that. Mm -hmm. So so when we got there, man, it, they, they needed to learn everything. Wow. But, but it was a commitment in place from the president to the athletic director that they, mm -hmm. they, they were tired, tired of losing. Mm -hmm. And the thing about Prairie View, that if you've never been there, it's not a losing place. Like mm -hmm. it is probably one of the most beautiful HBCU campuses you're ever going to see. There's no dorms. There's all apartments. <clears throat> you don't walk on the grass. I, I mean, it is an it, I call it the country club. Wow. So when you meet the people <clears throat> there, you can't, how can you lose when you have all of this support, all of the people that love that school? Every mm -hmm. I've never met an alum that don't love Prairie View. I've never met one that don't love that school. So mm -hmm. it was baffling to me. But it all came down to resources, having a leader that wanted to put money, because they, they have immaculate buildings on that campus. I mean, the, the engineering and the, you know, you architecture and the department, I mean, it, it, it's, it's gorgeous. So when Dr. Wright became the president, he made a commitment to athletics. Mm -hmm. He had went to Duke, went to Kentucky. So in Blue Blood School. So he was like, well, why not? Prairie View. And then he hired Charles McClellan as the athletic director, who's now the commissioner of the SWAC. Mm. And Charles was um, is a SWAC guy. He played, he went to Prairie View. He didn't play sports, but he was a accountant major. I always call him one of the smartest men I've ever met in my life. He never writes anything down. So I'm sitting there, I meet with him and I'm talking about this, talking about that. And he just said, okay, coach. Okay, coach. After about two or three months, I said, you, you know, oh, I got a coach. 
And he had it. And he had a great vision for Prairie View. And when he hired me, you know, I, and I knew I had the support and they, they allowed me to implement the things that I wanted to implement with no pushback at all. And it took us a couple of years and then we got rolling. And, and, and it was an exciting time. And I, I remember sitting at Texas A&M at the board. We were pitching the new stadium they have now. It was myself and Dr. Wright. We rolled up together. And he was nervous. He was just pacing because he was like, you know, because they the board wanted to hear from the football coach. So he didn't know what I was going to say up there. But he was just, he was nervous, I could tell. But he was like, man, you know, I had him. We, we got the grant. We got the money for them to build the new stadium they have now. And, and I always say that's a very special place. And when we flipped it and started winning, the support never changed. It was the same support as they were losing they got when they were winning. And that's the thing mm-hmm. that people don't understand about Prairie View. They losing all those games. They still was packing out the stands because the fans just uh-huh. loved the school. So it wasn't like a, a, a just a, a, a sad, pathetic place with just the parents in the stand. No, it was all the students, the alumni mm-hmm. packing out everywhere, but they just was losing. Mm-hmm. So once they invested mm-hmm. the money in there and um, hired the right coach, everything kind of took off. Mm-hmm. That's beautiful. That's be- and, and and I think it, it really ties into our topic of, you know, going through that period of being uncomfortable. You know, I, I would mm-hmm. imagine during those first couple of years, you know, I remember, you know, when I was at Virginia State, my first two years at Virginia State, we weren't the greatest team. We we had the talent, but, you know, our communication between players and coaches just wasn't always firing all cylinders. And it showed in our play, especially in crucial moments where, you know, fundamentally we should win the game. But because we had those communication breakdowns and we weren't always in sync, you saw those you saw those collapses and things like that. And then we had a, a brand new coach come in, Coach Scott, and that that foundation of really, you know, he really harped on us like, I'm gonna make you uncomfortable because that's where you're gonna grow. That's where that discipline and you know, motivation is a microwave thing, but discipline is, you know, constant, it's consistent. And so I, I can only imagine, you know, going through that, you know, that period for the, you know, for those young men and stuff like that. And then seeing that manifest, you know, all the things that you have, you know, the goals and things like that. I can only imagine what that was like being a part of that. And, you know, so after that, you, you move on to North Carolina Central University, where you also had success there. And then, um, so talk about how it felt for you, you know, being at North Carolina Central University and then coming in 2014, you know, becoming a athletic director at Bladensburg High School. So talk about that transition from being a head football coach to being an athletic director where, you know, as a head football coach, you know, you worried about, you know, the entire program of a football team. As an athletic director, you worry about the, the the well-being of an entire you know sports program and other sports. So, how was that transition for you? Yeah, that was that was really eye-opening. I think it is definitely making me a better coach today mm-hmm. because now I had to manage not just my coaching staff. I had to manage the staffs of all sports, and it, and it really sharpened my ear. You know, when I'm listening and trying to understand the needs of everyone and, and from their perspective, I can understand. The perspective of football. I got that. You know, when my defensive coordinator asked me for this or my linebacker coach, my runner, I got that. That that's that's easy. But when I have a cheerleading coach wanting, you know, rain jackets, and then you have the baseball coach wanting uh, you know, the, the batting cage and you know, the basketball coach wanting a, a shooting machine, and I like that mean, that means y'all gonna just shoot more threes. So but it's just me understanding just from a different lens. And it, it made me a sharper person because now I'm evaluating not, not necessarily wins and losses, and, but, but how do you matriculate your kids? You know, what are you doing to help them become better young people and, and prepare them mm-hmm. for their next phase, whether it's military, college? <clears throat> I've always challenged the coaches that I hired or I, that, that work for me that, how do you prepare them for when they leave you? I think that's just yeah. a, a very important component as a supervisor when you're dealing with young people. You know, look at how are they when they leave your program? Mm-hmm. And I, I've always, as a, as a college head coach, you know, I want you to be a productive man in society when you leave me. Mm-hmm. What that looks like, I'm not sure, but, but, but I want some kind of a level of productivity. And prime example about 
two or three, maybe about two or three years ago, we did like a little poll on, on the social media. And it was about 70 kids that I coached that was coaching. They were wow. doing some type of coaching, whether it was Little League, college, high school. Mm-hmm. And, and those were just, that was like two or three years ago. And I thought that was pretty cool because I oh, yeah. because of my coach. That's why I went mm-hmm. into the profession. And to know that there's so many young people out there that I've touched or I've coached mm-hmm. and they're in it as well, whether it's coaching their child sport. And I get all the calls. I get the texts. Coach, man, what? I got this little league. What which offer should I run? I got this and and I love it. I try to return them all and, and, and uplift those guys because a coach is a very important person. You know, it's a mm-hmm. it, it is yeah. extremely important because you can really tear down the future of a young person mm-hmm. if you are a bad coach. Mm-hmm. On the other hand, you can really <clears throat> propel the young person to greatness. If you just care about them, you don't even have to be a good coach. You could mm-hmm. just be a horrible X and O guy. But if you care about that kid mm-hmm. and his development, he's not going to remember all the losses. He's going to remember all the uplifting things you've done to help him or her be who they are. So that's my spiel on that. I see, I see athletic coaches as some of the most extraordinary life coaches that have ever walked the face of the earth. And, and if more of them coach had your approach to coaching, perhaps we would see less of the issues that we see, you know, in, in the media about some of the challenges that, that athletes are facing, particularly, I mean, because I mean, high school athletes make the news too because of inappropriate conduct, you know, off the field. Um, so we see that happening across the board, both in female and, you know, male athletics. Um, I think that what you're saying is profound in that, you know, it can't just be about X's and O's. It can't just be about wins and losses. It, it really does have to be about life because even in, athletics, it's relational. It's like coaching and athletic performance is not an intellectual exercise. It's about relationships. And I really truly believe that the more solid, the the, the healthier and the stronger the relationships are, but you said it, you know, these, these players will come out and they will give you their all, but are they going to give their all to a coach that they know doesn't care about them? Are they going to give their all to a coach that doesn't you know, even ask why you look like you're ready to cry or why you're having these angry outbursts or why you have a quitter's mentality, why you are so easily discouraged. If you don't care enough to ask those questions, why would a player give you their all? Why, why, why would they? Why would they put their mind and their body on the line for you every single solitary week, knowing that for you, it's all about X's and O's. For you, it's all about wins and losses. They won't, and they don't. You know, and, and that's, a, that's, a, that's a dynamic question, and, and it's loaded, because mm-hmm. you, you took me, I went to like three to four different places when you say why, because on one hand, they still will, but it's mm-hmm. gonna be for themselves. Mm. Then you're going to develop that selfish athlete, which is worse, because when adversity hit, they're not going to dig deep. They're going to quit. Yeah. You know, and then on the other hand, I don't necessarily want you to do it for me. I want you to do it for your teammates. I want to create the player driven culture, whereas Mm. I'm my brother's keeper. Mm. Take me out of the equation. I am the facilitator. Mm-hmm. I'm going to facilitate my team where they're going to be like this. Mm-hmm. I can go, I always tell them every team I record, I say, I go out there and get hit by a bus tomorrow. You know, you still need to go out and win this ball game. They're going to put another coach in place. Yeah. So it's not about me, mm-hmm. but it's about me to facilitate this framework mm-hmm. that we have. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's an awesome thing when I see players there's best men in each other's wedding. There's mm-hmm. godfathers to each other's children. That's mm-hmm. what I create. That's what I, that, 
That is who I am. That's the type of team I'm going to have. I, and I'm not going to compromise because it's for you. The wins going to come because we're going to work so hard. We're going to be each other's keeper. That's going to happen. But when you make it about yourself, I'm going to help you transfer. Mm. I, I'm, I'm just not, you're not going to fit the structure. You're, you're not going to fit what we're going to do here. So I'm going to help you leave. I'm not here to demoralize anyone. Yeah, yeah. But it's going to be done this way. I'm not going to compromise how I want my team. Mm -hmm. And I'm running a team for you. Mm -hmm. I'm going to create leaders. I'm going to create ownership. Mm -hmm. You're going to take ownership of this team. You're going to be lead. Prime example, you said something that, that triggered another one of my secrets. I can't give away all my secrets. Like I hired my new staff and I told them, this is what I want you to do. I want you to do, I think it was a Thursday, Friday, Saturday, they had four days to do this. Mm -hmm. I gave them the whole roster. I say, the position that you coach, I want you to call call each kid. Introduce yourself. Tell him you're excited to coach him. Ask him one interesting thing about himself. I said, mm -hmm. that's all I want you to do. I want you to start talking about no X's and O's. I want you to start talking about nothing else. Mm -hmm. And then when we come back on that Monday, we're going to meet. I want to go through that. So mm -hmm. that's, that's the initial introduction that Virginia State football player got with their position coaches. Mm -hmm. that's all I asked I said don't talk about football mm -hmm. just just those three things they hang up the phone and I'll take it from there because I'm doing something you know I don't want them messing it up right. you know? <laughs> they're gonna do it anyway the coach is gonna be sneaking meeting trying to do all that stuff I love it I know they're gonna do that you know <laughs> but I'm gonna play dumb like I don't know you know so but we're gonna we're gonna build something special at Virginia State that everyone's gonna be proud of. I, I'm 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 fired up to be back coaching, and and then just being able to lead young people. I, I love leading young people. And and, and, and I mean, just I, like coach, I got a semester left. All right, so I'm trying, <laughs> trying to tell you, you know, if y'all need a center, I, I look, I ain't, I can be backup. You know, I can be the journey. You know, I can be the elder statesman. You know, your wife ain't gonna let you do that. <laughs> that was no new baby. Oh, yo, oh, no. Nah. When do the schedules come out, Coach? When when does the schedule come out for, for this football season? They're out. Oh, it's, it's out, been man. out. Yeah. Okay. The season opens with uh, Lenore Ryan, correct? Yep. On September, I think September 3rd. 3rd. Yep. Okay, September so we 3rd. need to take a look at that because yeah. I might have to get on a plane. Yeah. yeah. So, 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 Coach, you know, talk, let's also talk about a little bit, you know, I, I also think, you know, within the last several years, you know, the resurgence and, you know, kind of the awareness of HBCU football, you mm -hmm. know. One of the things that, you know, for me, I, I've lived, you know, like a minute from Virginia State's campus, you know, basically my entire life. And even then, you know, I never knew how big HBCU football was until I became a Trojan myself. And then, you know, going, you know, playing my four years there and then really just, you know, immersing myself in, you know, HBCU football and really learning the history of it. You know, I'm starting to see a resurgence and an importance in it, but also I'm starting to see where, you know, we have coaches like you joining staffs and actually investing in the young men, not only in their athletic abilities, but who they are as people. And I think that's really important. So for you, let's talk about a little bit of it. Like you've already kind of mentioned it, but how important is it for you to continue to let these men know? Cause I think at, at, at division two, you know, a lot of the times, you know, all of us want to make the profession, you know, I think at some point, all of our dreams, well, most of us, not gonna say all, but most of our dreams is to play in the NFL and reach the professional level. And we know the D2 level, you know, it's still possible, but that dream is a little bit harder. But and to your point also, and I know this is also a loaded question as well, but just roll with me on this one. So you talked about the importance of, you know, leading men after football, after they finish playing the sports and stuff like that. How important is it for you to, when you recognize that student athlete who they're all in on football, like that is the end all be all for them. How important is it for you to really help guide them to understanding that, you know, there is life outside of football? Whether or not you make it to the professional league, semi-pro, whatever the case may be, one day you will hang your cleats up and you have to have a plan professionally, personally, and emotionally for life after football and life after sports. Well, that's easy because I'm going to encourage you to give it all. If that's what you want, do it. The NCAA has a structure of, in place that's going, you're going to wake up in four years, you're going to have a degree. Yeah. And that's the beautiful thing about that because college is – is a place that you find yourself. Mm -hmm. So I encourage more than football. I, mean, I encourage fraternities. I encourage student government. 
I encourage to be a part of the community that you're in. So as you're being a part of things, if you just football, 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 I'm be like, cool, but you still got to go to class. You know, you still might end up getting your little girlfriend, you know, so you're still going to have something other than football that you're going to be a part of. But I'm going to encourage whatever, whatever you say you want to do, I'm going to encourage that. And I want you to be the best at it. So I'm going to help you. But we all know this comes to an end at some point. Mm. And I would like to think that through the programming that I'll have, through the speakers that I'll bring in, through just the mandates that I put in place and just the sitting one-on-one talks that you'll have with me over four years, if you just football, 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 when it comes to an end and it doesn't be what you want it to be, you'll be at least balanced enough or at least I'll be able to find a way to get the strength that you need to still be that productive man, to still be that productive husband and father. Because that's serious to me. So if, if, if I, if I, by me believing that as my philosophy, I have to incorporate other things than football. Absolutely. Yeah. Another thing I want to ask you, um, you know, me and Dr. Pitts are both, you know, mental health professionals and things like that. And one of the things we've always talked about on this show is how, you know, I would say within the last maybe two or three years, mental health amongst, you know, student athletes and professional athletes has definitely increased and become more of a, a, a big topic. And we've seen, unfortunately, a lot of student athletes just in April, there was, I think, five collegiate athletes who committed suicide. Yeah. Um, we've seen where we see, you know, professional athletes who are retired, you know, they have, you know, mental health issues and mental health tragedies and things like that. So how important is it for us to really, especially at the HBCU level, because even at the HBCU level, one of the things I always saw was, is that there was a, a, a extreme lack of mental health resources. And it, when I was playing, it was never really talked about, you know, and we had I had teammates who, you know, now that I am on the other side of it, realize that, you know, oh yeah, they did have mental health issues. It wasn't that they were just from the hood and they didn't know no better or they were crazy. Like, no, it's like they they really had, you know, some mental health issues that were never addressed. And unfortunately, only their talent was solicited, not them as a person. So how important is it that we find a way to integrate, you know, mental health into our student athletes and, and really make sure that they do have those resources? Because as important as it is for them to be sharp on the field and things like that in the classroom, they have to be sharp as a human being. And you touched on that. So what are some things you think we can do as an HBCU family to really bring awareness to our student athletes' mental health and make sure they have the resources available on campus, you know, for them? Yeah, I think the first thing is definitely having them knowing where the outlet is. Them know, I know we have a, um, a, a mental health uh, professional at Virginia State University and making sure that they have that number, that they, that they, there is readily available to them, mm-hmm. you know, and, and as, and as the leaders, as the leaders, we can't downplay when, it, when a person is, is, is having an issue, you know, you, you can't, you know, <laughs> brush it off and get back in there, suck it up. You know, you know, you can't do that. You may get do that in the heat of it, Hey, look, man, I need you to go ahead and make this play. But look, when this game is over, let, let me walk you over, get the coach, take him over to this place and take him to, to where he needs to go to get the help that he needs. You know, so you can never ignore the cries because the signs are going to always be there. They're going to always be there. And if you're just so driven on win, 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 you know, you'll miss them. And it's not because you don't care about the student athlete. It's just because, you know, you, you want to win. And I want to win bad. I want to win worse than anybody you can think of. But when you put an infrastructure in place, you know, and I think for me, they'll they'll see that when it's game time, it's game time. We 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 here to play this game. Now, if you having a breakdown in the middle of the game, I'm just have to get you out and get someone else in there, and and then we'll deal with that. But if I have enough pro enough programming throughout. That again, that's my focus. I'm, I'm gonna deal with all of those things during the week. So come Saturday, there's no more distractions left that you can go out and perform at your optimal level. But you know, and it, it's my job to recognize that during the week. That's just in season, but that's only 10, 11 weeks. So what about the rest of the year? That's when you start your programming. That's when you start the, the mandates. You know, you have to go to study hall. You have to have a tutor. 
You know, you put you, you so you say I'm taking care of the, ac the academic piece. You got to go lift weights. You got to work out. So now I'm taking care of the physical piece. Then I'll have a team pastor. And then I'm taking care of the spiritual piece. Then I'm like I'm encouraging student government. I'm encouraging fraternities. I'm encouraging I'm taking mm -hmm. care of the social piece. Then from an emotional standpoint. If, you know, now we, you know, we can kind of tunnel in on that. So you you put these things in place that when they have an episode, it's not massive. It, it's, it's kind of manageable, but we still keep it in focus. We graduate and we're still trying to win ball games because mm -hmm. when it's in season, hey guys, I gave you what, 50 other weeks, uh, you know, I mean, 40 other weeks to do this, to do that. You had this, you had that. These 10, 11, 12 weeks, I need you. I need you focused on what I need. Because I'm giving you everything you got on the back end, on the front end. Then when mm -hmm. it comes to the season on the back end, come mm -hmm. on, man. We done had this talk. We done had this meeting. We done had this speaker. We done had this workshop. We done had these things. You should be strong. And if we've done all these things and you still can't do it, maybe college is not for you. Mm -hmm. So that's when you're creating that player-driven culture. That's when you're starting to create that, that place where, you know, you know you're going to get the help being in my program. That's that's undoubted. But as I'm giving, you got to give. Mm -hmm. Going back to that selfish athlete, you can't just keep taking, taking, taking. And what mm -hmm. I want from you, I want you to go into class. I want you performing on the field. Everything mm -hmm. else is extra. Mm -hmm. I want to, if I may, um, and I think, Coach, you sort of alluded to it, but I want to sort of expound on it a little bit because I think that it's really important for athletic programs that, you know, throughout the country, especially, you know, we've been hearing about it for years. You touched on it at the beginning of the show about the racial tension that exists in the country. Um, and we, you know, there was this onset of diversity and inclusion training and then where the LGBTQIA plus community is concerned, this, you know, tremendous emphasis on what that looks like in athletic play. And, you know, most recently in the news this week, there were some issues with um, being addressed for transgender players and all of that. So just illustrating that point. But, but what I think is really important is just like we have diversity and inclusion training for our professionals. I think that it's equally important to have mental health awareness training for our athletic departments. Um, I totally agree with everything that you said about dealing with it, you know, and making sure that they have the number. But another layer of awareness, just my opinion, has to be there, just like in the beginning of the show, where I touched on the importance of people being aware of, of suicide being a major cause of death in this country. So oftentimes, for me being the outside looking in and, and having, you know, served in different roles in my relationship to athletics, one of the things that I still see that there's room for, for growth is awareness in that we want to make sure that we're providing the psychoeducation to the athletic departments so that they know what they're looking for. The positions coaches are aware that, you know, whomever is not just having a rough day because when and this is a captain obvious statement that I'm going to say, what you and, you know, every other coach I would imagine is aware of is that there's still this tremendous stigma around mental health, right? And because of the tremendous stigma that exists around mental health, our players are very apprehensive about disclosing the fact that they're having mental health struggles. That's why I love your approach so much because as you get to know your players, as your coaches get to know your players on a more intimate level, both on and off the field, what that can potentially create is a stronger place and space for emotional safety. When people feel safe with you, when people know that they can trust you, then it creates space for them to be willing to be more vulnerable and transparent with you. And they can talk to you openly and honestly without the the threat of thinking that they're going to lose their position without the threat of thinking that if they are a contender to go to the league, that it's not going to infringe upon their chances at making the league. But there has to be heightened awareness. And oh, by the way, 
the challenge that we then face with that is that because it's a stigma among black and brown persons, what is each coach's mindset as it relates to mental health? Because, and Captain Obvious statement, I'm a black woman just putting it out there to the two black men on the panel, is that so oftentimes in our communities where our black and brown men are concerned, any form of mental health, anything is considered a weakness. So I'm it's that internal negative narrative that becomes their truth and it's to a detriment. So I think that it's really important to, to, to collaborate and, and to, to have that discussion within athletic departments around what does psychoeducation and heightened awareness around mental health look like and how can that be incorporated proactively rather than waiting until a problem arises and then we go into reaction mode. Just something I wanted to put on your radar to think about. No, I mean, I've worked, my last job at mm -hmm. the University of Maryland was with Michael Loxley. Mm -hmm. And, you know, this is known publicly and mm -hmm. he lost a son to mental illness. Yeah. He lost a son to mental illness. He died, Miko. Mm -hmm. And but Mike and I are friends for over 30 years. Yeah. And, the programs that he implemented at Maryland centered around mental illness yeah. and the accessibility that he allowed yeah, yeah. his players, you know, has, you know, touched me because I also have a child mm -hmm. that's mentally ill. Mm -hmm. So him and I would spend hours talking and talking about it and, mm -hmm. and, and helping me with resources and, and, yeah. and what did him and kid do with me and, and, and things like that. So, it's, it's, a, it's a subject that's near and dear to me. Thank you. And I know they can't help themselves. Right. They can't help themselves without right. meds. Because if they get off their meds, it's a wrap. Say I don't it. care who it is, that's right. how long they may think they are, or what right. you may think of them, or what your ignorance may be. Because I was ignorant. You know, I'm thinking, well, you know, I know you know better. I know you could do this. But then I had to start doing my research yeah, on the yeah. bipolar and the schizo yeah. and, and understanding that, you know what? They can't, they can't do it alone. They cannot. They don't have, they can never connect the dots like you and I. So right. if you think they can, you, you're, you're going to be so frustrated. Yeah. So I look at those players the same way. Okay. So it's like, okay. Okay, because because college ain't for everyone, right? Because if because the age that they start showing it is about 21, mm -hmm. 19, 20, 20, 19, 21, 23, 24. Mm -hmm. In that range is when you start seeing signs. Mm -hmm. And from our community, oh, they tripping, oh, they crazy, oh, that dude mm -hmm. is. And they'll, they'll you know he's crazy, you know he bipolar. They mask it with alcohol, they mask it with drugs, right? So me knowing these things and lived and had lived it, you know, mm -hmm. it's kind of like, okay, let's make sure that we just got to make sure that they are help for these young people because they can live a, a, a nice, healthy life, not Absolutely. necessarily healthy, but they can live a, a, a healthier life mm -hmm. if they've accepted it early on. And then they mm -hmm. learn how to be mm -hmm. di disciplined enough to take their meds yeah, yeah. and then they, they're, they're program. But the thing about it, now I'm glad you brought this up because now I'm going to go real. I'm, I, I use the term cheat sheet a lot. Like, mm -hmm. create a cheat sheet so I can know what to do. I consider myself a fairly educated person that's, that's kind of resourceful and smart. Mm -hmm. But I tell you, I had the dawn this time trying to find resources for my child, trying to find out what to do, how to do it, where to go. There's nothing mm -hmm. out there. I go into brick wall after brick wall after brick wall. Mm -hmm. And 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 what I've started, what I did, because I know some therapists, I know some psychiatrists that I've been trying to talk to to help me. Mm -hmm. They're asking me questions now that I figured out how to get her the help that she needs. Mm -hmm. And it's like, why isn't this information readily available? Mm -hmm. So when I drive down the street, you see a homeless person, they didn't just show up there. They it was a process for them to get there. That's right. But there's there's 
I can't Google something. I can't go out and find, you got to do this first, do this, do this, call this person. I'm calling, I'm, I must have called over a hundred psychiatrists, psychologists, therapists, officers. Do you all do this? Do you take Medicaid? Do you do, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm just out here on my own. Yeah. And, and to me, is, there has to be something out there to just say, this is what has to occur for a person. They can't do it themselves. Yeah. Right. They can't do this. And I'm thinking <clears> like, <throat> what about some of the parents of kids that may be a little ill themselves? Mm -hmm. How do they help mm -hmm. their loved one? They don't. I, it, I, I, coach, I can, I, so I, I just came out of the community. I was doing community counseling for the last six years. And even in the state of Virginia, you know, one of the things I always tell people is, you know, at, at a state level, you know, they always advertise how much emphasis they put on mental health. But when you really get down to the nitty gritty, you really understand that it's the insurance companies that really set the tone of who's going to get help and how they get help. And, I, and I'll speak on this just in the state of Virginia. One of the things I've noticed, especially in the inner cities of Petersburg, Richmond and stuff like that, is as, as easily accessible as they make services seem, you have to jump through hoops and hurdles that you can't even <laughs> imagine just to get halfway decent care. And to your point about psychologists, psychiatrists, things like that, you know, just I just know in the Central Virginia area, is extremely hard to get in with a lot of psychiatrists and psychologists because one, there's not that many of them. Two, they're booked up for months at a time. Three, there might be one or two in the entire area who look like us. Just in the field overall, there's less than 5% black therapists, psychologists, and psychiatrists. And child and, psychiatrists are slim pickings too, and there's definitely none of us. Exactly. Like and and so we as, as much as they talk about representation and stuff like that, we're severely underrepresented in the mental health field. And, yeah. and to your point, when you have the the, the trauma cycles that we see in, in, in our in our culture, it, um, I can't remember the professor's name, but it's a professor from out in Washington, and she uh, coined the term post-traumatic slave syndrome, and just mm -hmm. the residual effects that we see from slavery and in the decades of oppression and the systemic, you know, oppression that we see within our society and stuff mm -hmm. like that, and just the fundamental breakdown of the black family and people of color's family, and people, you know, they don't understand that these things are passed down generationally generationally a lot of people trauma bond over their pain and stuff like that and so when you don't have those resources to really let people know that look the pain you've gone through there are resources out there there are answers out there there are help out there mm -hmm. you're absolutely right they make it way too difficult at times to access help way too difficult and, and i wholeheartedly agree with you on that and you know I, I will speak for myself i won't speak for all the mental health providers out there but i will say i speak for myself and you know at being a former student athlete, I saw how underrepresented we were as student athletes when it came to mental health. Yeah. I see now how really underrepresented we are, not only as student athletes, but people of color. And, you know, yeah. one of the things I've always said is that in my position that I hold, I will take that responsibility of making sure that any student athlete or any person of color who, for that matter, will get the adequate care and resources they need because mm -hmm. it's important. The over the overall well-being of our people as individuals I always say like it takes a village to raise people it takes mm -hmm. a village you have to have a village of support yeah. across all boards of your life and when you don't have a village and you try going about it alone you can you can go a ways alone but you can go really really far with a village and yeah. you know and i appreciate you speaking on that and, and you know I, I, as a you know as a parent i can you know I understand how other parents, when they come to me and say, look, I don't have the resources or I can't afford this and do that. They don't understand that, you know, mental health, mental health resources shouldn't be where you have to jump through hoops and hurdles. You've been going through hoops and hurdles your entire life. And so for you to have to go through additional hoops and hurdles just to get halfway decent help or adequate help, that's a disservice to our people. And so I appreciate you speaking on that. And we have to do more, not only in the, in the mental health professional field, but we have to be better as people, making sure that we help other people. I always say like, everybody's going through something, but for some reason, when it comes to them, they ignore everybody else. Mm, okay. and, and, and it bothers me that people can say, oh, everybody's going through something. But the moment that, you know, they see somebody going through something, oh, well, I mean, you know, you had to figure it out on your own. You know, I, I'm going through something too. No, like the one of the things, that, and, and I think, and it sounds like, you know, the, the humbleness you learn when you really understand that, you know, people don't have it all figured out. People don't have it all together and that's okay. It's okay not to be okay sometimes, but we make it so hard not to be okay sometimes. <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and, you know, it, it's really a travesty coach. So, you know, I, 
I, I definitely, you know, understand, you know, your frustrations and just the hoops and hurdles, you know, you, you've had to go through as a parent just to find, you know, decent resources for your child and things like that. And it's really something that I know me and Dr. Pitts are trying to do our best to make sure that the best quality help is accessed, you know, people who, who would never fathom getting that type of help. So I appreciate you touching on that, Coach. Thank you for your transparency. So, so coach, I, I, I kind of had a few more questions for you before we, you know, because, you know, we, we asked you to come on the show for a reason and to promote your book and everything. And we definitely oh, yeah, want to get to that because that's book. super important. But I had a couple I had a couple questions I had to ask you first. Number one. So being a, 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 a former student athlete bulldog, being a former coach of the bulldog and stuff like that, I would imagine, you know, traveling down, you know, 95 to, you know, Ettrick, Virginia and being the head coach of Virginia State. I'm pretty sure when October, what is it, October? I think it's October 9th, 3rd. I October 8th. October 8th. I would imagine that week is going to be, you know, some mixed emotions. So so talk about, like, talk about, you know, like you mentioned, you know, being excited, getting back on the field as a coach and everything. So how do you, what are, what are some of the emotions you're feeling about, you know, going against your former team and things like that and coaching against them? Because I will say, like, as much as Union was our rival, you know, that's the big rival and everything, I, when we played Bowie State, I got up. Like, I mean, out of my five, out of my top five college games that I played in, four of them involved Bowie. And I, I always some said, great like, games, even when I was a player, man. It's, it just seemed like every time Bowie and Virginia State play, it just go down to the wire. It's, it's always, always close ball games. And I don't expect nothing different this year. Um, I've never coached against Bowie State. I've never coached against them in all my career. And and um, I'm actually, you know, looking forward to it. I mean, I, I don't know. It'll be a first. And if, you, if you're in your 50s and you can experience a first, that's pretty cool. So, yeah. uh, you know, that's the way I look at it. You know, I'm going to find out that positive spin on it, you know. But yeah. I'm, it's going to be very – I'm going to see a lot of familiar faces. And, uh, you know, that's all, that's all everybody up here want to talk about when they talk to me. Man, we playing y'all for homecoming. <laughs> you know, we got we you know, we got our rooms. We coming down. I just said, okay, come on, man. <laughs> you know, I see you. I see you. Depending on the outcome, I might see you after the game. But <laughs> man, I remember the, I remember the last time we played Bowie for homecoming my junior year. It went three overtimes, and we won forty-seven to forty-four, and it was by far the most exciting game I ever played in my life. And, and like I said, the one thing I always said about Bowie is. For the longest time, I always felt like Bowie had some of the most supreme talent in all of the CIAA, and it wasn't even close. Like, I mean, from from top to bottom, I felt like the roster was always extremely talented. And, you know, I always got excited when we played y'all. So I'm definitely going to be in attendance for that game because I'm <laughs> super excited. But that's always my favorite game of the season was Virginia yeah, State plays yeah. Bowie State because, I mean, it, the rivalry is just it, – it's exciting. It's never a dull moment. So I'm looking forward to that. And, and my last question, Coach, is, you know, so you mentioned something interesting about, you know, what you had your coaches do when they first got to Virginia State. And so now I'm going to give the opportunity to ask you, you know, like I said, at the beginning of, you know, the topic, I said, you know, if I could describe you, you know, not only were you a supreme scholar student athlete, but you are a supreme scholar man and just, and just a great black man overall. So for you, like what are, I always like to ask people like you who are highly successful and, and you know, who look like us and do more things and just, you know, as much as you are a football coach, you do so many more things that are just, I mean, just as interesting to talk about it as football. So for you, I always like to ask, what are some books or what are some things that you could give young black men out there that, you know, today who are listening that they could either read or, or look into a research that might help them along the way of not only becoming a great man in their profession, but just a great overall man personally. Um, one thing I, one thing I started doing many, many years ago are daily affirmations mm. and, and you can get them, I personally use Joel Osteen mm -hmm. every day. You know, he'll, he'll give you a scripture, he'll give you a story, he'll give you a prayer. Mm -hmm. If you can start your day like that, mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty refreshing. Mm -hmm. it, it, puts, it, it, it kind of centers me every day, every morning I'll get up. He, and he does it five days a week. On Saturdays, I'll probably just be Henry. <laughs> and then on Sundays, I get my gospel going. But, but I, I kind of center myself every day. You my advice would be to a young person or a person, anyone, to, to try to find something every day that centers you. It doesn't have to take long. It could be a minute. It could be two minutes. Something that's yours, that you to just push you in the posture you want to be in to go tackle that day. And it's one day at a time. 
It's one day at a time. Don't try to do something that's going to get you ready for a week or a month. You know, you just do one day. And if, I, I promise you, you do it for about two or three weeks, it will become a habit. And it's just going to be who you are. And then those, those, those centering, I call them centering exercises, they could become other things. Like my lady and I are doing the 40 day challenge right now with uh, not necessarily a challenge, but um, we, we're reading the book together. And it's, a, it's 40 days with the scriptures and then we compare notes, but I'm, I'm actually listening to it. I'm, I'm not reading, she's reading, I'm, I'm listening to it. <laughs> but so that kind of taking, that's like the substitute for these 40 days, you know? So, but you, you're used to doing something every day. So I don't want to necessarily get into what type or what it is, but I'm just, I would challenge young people to, or either people to just find something and, and you just isolate five minutes a day for yourself. I like to do it in the morning before mm -hmm. I get going. And, um, and, and it kind of puts you in a good partial, or the partial that you want to be in, because mm -hmm. you got to find that thing that, that push you in the posture you want to be in, and then you go tackle your day. I love it. But for little people, second through sixth grade, I got something for you right here. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I got something let, for let, you right uh, here. Let's talk about it. So, City Boy C Man has character hitting the bakery. Coach, talk to us. Like, like I said, a, a, as great as I, I would love to, you know, chop it up with you about football. Like I said, you're doing so many amazing things off the field. And right here, this right here is, is what I'm talking about. You know, so talk to us about your book, City Boy C Man, and how that came about yeah. and how the people can get it. Well, um, C Man is my name, C M A N. I knew C Man before I knew Henry. And everybody called me C Man. As a matter of fact, my middle school or junior high when I went, junior high school principal and my high school principal uh, both sent me a text about this book. And, and they was like, I always knew you had that in your C-Man because they called me C-Man as well, mm -hmm. you know, in school. So, but the, I created a character and for our older folk to remember Fat Albert, it's similar to that. Yeah. You know, he has his <laughs> friends and then there's always a scenario or situation that they get in. Mm -hmm. And then Fat Albert is the voice of reason. And that's who City Boy C-Man is. And he's the voice of reason. And then at the end of the book, there's a reflection that kind of mm -hmm. gives you a little, a little recap, a lesson. So for this first, this is a, it's a series. This is the first of five. And this is City Boy, Sea Man has character hidden in the bakery. In the up in uh, DC in Northwest, there was a bakery right next to Howard University. You can smell that sweet aroma from miles and miles. And you knew when a fresh batch was being made. And um so they had his friends. He had City Boy, City Man friends. He had Hungry Hatch, Positive Player, Big Brownie, and Funny Fence. And Funny Fence is the new guy. So Funny Fence is saying, hey, let's go hit the bakery. Hitting the bakery is not hitting it. It's sneaking in the back and taking some smacks <laughs> that you don't necessarily need to be taking. And um, so the guys are in a situation where they uh, have to make a choice. They have to make a choice. So City Boy C Man ended up telling his sister, Talented Tracy, who told his other sister, Neat Nikki. So Neat Nikki ended up telling Magnificent Mama. Magnificent Mama told Dependable Daddy. I love it. And, and then they had to sit down with, with City Boy C Man and, and they told him they knew he would do the right thing. They trust him and things like that. So this book is about making the right decisions. Listen to your parents. Trusting your value system. Yeah. And I, I just don't think there's never early enough time that you can introduce these type of things to your child. Yeah. And and and, and in the end, City Boy C Man does the right thing. So I think it's a pretty cool book. Um, and we got they've all all five have been written and illustrated, so they're ready to go. So we'll nice. roll the next one out around. We're thinking the end of the year. But the website, we're having a virtual book launch tomorrow. Mm -hmm. And you can uh, register at the, from the website. The website is www.cityboyseaman.com. And that's C-I-T-Y-B-O-Y-C-M-A-N.com. So you can go there, you can purchase the book, or you can um, uh, register for the virtual book launch tomorrow. And uh, I'm, I'm, I'm super excited about it. 
You see, he got he got those uh, I don't want to call it commanders, the, the old <laughs> red skin colors, <laughs> and um, you know, so it's, it's it's my city because the eye nice. is, the the eye is the uh, monument. Oh yeah, oh yeah, okay. And, and I see the, uh, the, the capital, old. the Washington Capitol. Then you got the little DC logo. I so love I'm it. DC boy. Man, okay. man, coach. Coach, I, I'm definitely got to order my copy soon. And, and like I said, I, I think this, out of all the things that we've talked about today, I think I'm, I'm the most excited about this because I think it's so important. I always say it's so important for our young kids, especially our young black boys, to see older black men doing things outside of just sports, entertainment, mm -hmm. you know, music, mm -hmm. things like doing so many. And not to say that you can't do those things, but you can be so much more than a ball player, so much more than an entertainer or anything like that. Mm -hmm. You can be an author, you can be a scholar, you can be a, a mm -hmm. businessman, you know, all these things that you can be outside of just being an athlete. And coach, I, I, I'm so excited. I can't wait to get my copy of this because I have a one-year-old son. So definitely going to be reading. Uh, uh, He's going to be a city boy, C-Man. Yeah. 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 So, so coach, as we get ready to wrap up, man. So day one of camp is coming soon. I think at least about, about six weeks. I used to always say after 4th of July, yeah. You know, July was just a blur. Like, you know, next thing uh -huh. you know, you so so day one at camp. What's the tone you're trying to set day one at camp? What's what's the message and vision you wanna you wanna leave with your student athletes on day one of camp? Well, um, that's a good question. I haven't even I haven't gotten in that mode yet. That's gonna come, but for me, I just want maximum effort. Everything we do, you gotta go give me your max and your best. If that's your best. That's the best effort you got. That's all I ask. That's all I ask. We got enough water. We have enough ice. It's going to be demanding. It's going to be challenging. It's going to be hard. But if you're giving me your best, that's all I want. That's all I want. I'm, I'm going to determine who's going to play based off of how, 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 how hard they practice and how good they execute. So, you know, you can't trick me. You know, so if you work hard, you, you're executing at a high level, you play. If you don't, you don't play. It ain't, it ain't even rocket science here, man. It's, it's just give me everything you got. And, and, and if that's your best and it's just not good enough, I got to find better for Virginia State. It ain't, it ain't no um, rock against you. I still going to help you go wherever you need to go. Or even if you stay, you can still be a, there's other areas you can serve this team. Because mm -hmm. we'll do community service. We'll do other things. You could be a great guy in the community. You could be a great guy to host recruits when they come. There's other areas that you could do if you just can't perform at a high level because I'm planning to always recruit better every year recruit better mm. and challenge our players man you want to be challenged but in this time we living in everybody go hit the, hit the transfer portal or he yelled at me or or he he don't want to play me or he don't like me all right it ain't because it ain't you're not gonna get that out of me I love all you guys I'm, mm -hmm. I'm trying to make you the best version of yourself but I'm also mm -hmm. get paid to do a job and, and I'm a football coach I get paid to develop young men and win ball games so, and that's what I'm going to do. I oh, promise that. I'm going to do that. <laughs> well, Coach, like I said, man, I, I'm excited. I'm going to have to email uh, Ms. Ms. Davis, see, you know, can she check on that semester for me? Because, you know, <laughs> hey, look, I just need a couple weeks, man. You know, I need a couple weeks, some WD-40 for these knees. And, you know, yeah, hey, look, man. You, know. you need a practice squad center, man. Let me know. Just <laughs> let me know, man. But look, Coach, it was a pleasure having you on the show. Thank you so much for taking your time out of your Saturday, uh, chopping it up with us, Coach. Good luck to you this season. I wish all the best success for you this season as you lead these young men onto the uh, football field this season. So good luck to you. If you ever need anything from us, Coach, you know where to find us at. So look, y'all, that was House Talk pregame. That's a wrap for season two. Enjoy your summers. Make sure you all check out City Boy C-Man Has Character. Check out the book premiere tomorrow. Look, y'all, have a great summer. Be blessed, and we'll talk to you soon. See you back September 3rd, everybody. Bye-bye.